Belize and Lenny show again. We're on starting unit 11, um, amazingly enough. And unit 11, centerpiece of unit 11 is the imperative. So what is the imperative? Um, the, the nicest definition that I know of is, um, is a sentence whose verb is an imperative is one of which you cannot ask the question, is this true? Mm. <laughs> if somebody tells you to sit down, you don't, it makes no sense to say, is this true? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay, so, but a, a more direct way of putting it is um, an imperative is a command to someone. Okay, it's a speech act, it tells people to do things. So, um, the, the, in Indo European, the language from which Greek was descended, there was one form, we can, we can reconstruct there was one form of the imperative which consisted of the verbal stem with an ending eh. Okay, so in other words, it's like a dictionary entry of a word. It's the word in its most basic, in the verb in its most basic form. Okay, um, but what happened in Greek and it happened in other languages as well is that it got that form, even though in the oldest text you have it, things that, so for example, here that this is the best way. The example uh, that everybody uses in the linguistic and the sort of linguistics is there's one place in the Iliad where Agamemnon says to 15 people, Egere, there's a Greek verb egero that means to wake up, and, and he says it to a whole bunch of people. There's no singular or plural, it's just you all wake up fast, okay? It's an ordering them. Um, but what happens is that this becomes elaborated in Greek. In the first place, what happens is that Egera gets reinterpreted as a second person singular form, so then you generate a second person plural, Egerete, okay? Mm -hmm. um, but then Greek does an, a weird thing that we don't have in English, which is a third person imperative, which is like uh, Homer Simpson's slogan when he ran for mayor. Let him do it. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Let someone else do it. <laughs> right? Um, so so, or let her do it, or let them do it. Okay, we, we, don't, we don't normally use that kind of expression, and, but, and we don't really think of it as an imperative, but Greek generated imperatives as having person, so it generated second and third persons, and believe it or not, there's also a way to do first person imperatives, and you already know what it is, which is the hortatory subjunctive. Mm. Let me do it, and let, let's us do it, right. okay? So, um, that's that's what takes the place of a form of the first person imperative. So we have a really a complete inflectional category. So what what Belisi has put on the iPad for you on, uh, under imperative endings is from page 311 of the book. We're just missing one column because we expose we've already exposed it enough on that page, which gives you the imperative endings for the present and the aorist. There are no other forms of the imperative in classical Greek than present and aorist imperatives. Mm. So um, the first, yeah, the next thing that we can talk about is, well, what's the difference between them? When do you use one and when do you use the other? So the, the rule is very simple. The default imperative, the normal imperative is the aorist, okay? And that's an old thing, and that's, that's, the, that's what you would expect as an, an imperative. When you use the present imperative, like Agamemnon does in, in that moment in the Iliad, mm -hmm. he's yelling at them. He's pounding, he's pounding the table. He's really, really, they're not waking up. <laughs> okay, so it's, it's the difference between what linguists call an unmarked form, you remember this terminology, and a marked one. You can use the, the unmarked one all the time, but in special circumstances you use the marked one. Okay, they don't mean anything different. They're just um, things that are certain situations in which you use, you use one against the other. So uh, when it comes to forms, okay, um, if you look at the at the endings, we're dealing with a very simple set of uh, forms for two persons, one for the present active, one for the present middle passive, okay, and then we, in that first aorist um, we're looking at, at the same thing, uh, an aorist active and an aorist middle, but because the aorist has a separate form in the passive. Mm -hmm. The one column we're missing is the aorist passive imperative, which, believe it or not, exists. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, if you take our sample verb luo or paideo, and you want to set tell one person to learn, you say paideo, and then 
if it's if it's a third person imperative, let her or him do it. It's by Delato. Um, so you just tack these endings on to the um, to the appropriate imperfective aspect or present stem. It's not it's not very challenging. Okay, so the the forms you may notice uh, all of them are are distinctive except for the second person plural one which is the same as the second person plural of the indicative, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so how can you tell whether a given eta form like paudelita is an imperative or, or, a, uh, or an indicative verb? Well, you have to tell from the context. And Greek mm -hmm. also uses particles to signal things like imperatives. But Lizzie, you're not enough in the picture here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too much and you're not enough here. Distracting I'll move over. Yeah. All right, that's better. So, um, so I think the thing to do is to memorize these endings, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, the, middle, uh, pre the middle passive present endings is going to be pi del wu and pi del esto, pi del esto and pi del esto. And all these forms, by the way, are, have recessive accent, just like normal verbs do, okay? Um, the, the aorist forms are interesting um, because Again, these are forms that have aspect, not tense. Okay, the difference between them, as you said, is just a matter of which is marked and which is unmarked. Um, the aorist form, therefore, does not have an augment. Okay, um, and they all exhibit the sa sign of the aorist, except for the second person singular form, which is the ending is sigma omicron nu. That's the let's put a box around that one. That's the weirdest of all these forms. Okay, don't. It's hard to understand where it came from. It's difficult to identify because it doesn't look like what it is. That looks like a future participle, okay, ending, a mm -hmm. lunar future participle ending. Mm -hmm. And indeed, you can mistake it for one, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and and when you see future new, future lunar participle, aorist imperative is not going to spring to mind. They're two different from each other, mm -hmm. right? So it's a form that's actually quite common in Greek, but it's going to take you a while to get the hang of it because it looks like nothing else, or and it doesn't look like what it should be. I think the other aorist, first aorist forms are pretty straightforward. Sata santon is like eta anton, and sai sastho and sasta sastho are analogous to the present middle forms, uh, middle passive forms, although the aorist they're only middle. So, so that's uh, that's one thing to learn. But when it comes to the contract verbs, okay, of which we now have three types, um, you're going to get contraction of the vowels in these cases. Um, remember the rule, though, that we said that for alpha contract verbs, when you have the, notice, by the way, the thematic vowel epsilon and omicron alternation is consistent with the rules that we learned, right? It's uh, in the singular OEE -E, and the plural OEO, -E okay? So these forms are, are not are consistent with that difference, okay? There's nothing funny about that. But when it comes to, for example, the alpha contract verbs, if you remember the rule that we have an e-thematic vowel, you have a long alpha. When you have an O, you have an omega, okay? That's what you're going to see. So you're going to get tima as the first, as the second person singular uh, imperative of timao, the long alpha, okay? Uh, and then you, not, no, it doesn't have an accent on it. No. Nope. Oh, yeah. Because it's recessive, yep. So it's uh, just an I acute accent on the iota, okay? Because it comes from tima, eh, okay? And then timato, that's going to have a certain flex. <laughs> okay, because it's timato. Okay, um, and then in the plural, again you have the, the epsilon, so you're going to have timata with a certain flex over the alpha, because it's going to be timato. And then in the, in the plural, it's going to be timonto. Okay, so you're going to get the alternation between A and O. And the epsilon contracts, the poya O types, okay. Remember what we said, we have a substitute an alternation for the alternation between E and O, an alternation between EI and OU. So you're going to get poye, poye rather, in the second person singular, P-O-I with, with an acute accent on the poi, mm -hmm. okay, and poieto in the, in the third person singular form, okay, and then poieta in the second person plural, and poiunton, which, by the way, that form is identical to another that you know, genitive plural of masculine and neuter participles, right? So watch out for that, okay? Mm -hmm. 
Um, and you know the, the same thing happens with the middle passive endings. Um, I don't think the, you know the principles that you we taught you about how to deal with contract verbs will work just fine. When it comes to the Omicron contract verbs, what are you going to get? You're going to get ooh everywhere. Mm -hmm. Delu, deluto, deluta, and delunto. <laughs> okay, and so forth. So I think you can pretty much figure your way through these, okay? There's only one thing more that we want to show you, and that's the aorist passive endings. You want to make a new page of Belisi, and we can do them. So it's, um, you can put in parentheses, theta, okay, for the, no, no, all right. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so here, you can do it like this, two, oops. I have you. Okay. Two, three, two, three. So what I'm saying is we can do this. Theta, theta. Yeah. We want to put the theta there because that really, you remember the theta is optional. There are some errors passives like for a blobane, okay, that don't have it. Okay. The theta, but mo most of them do, and, the, and um, the, the reason that you, okay, so that when you do have the theta, you have t, but when you don't have the theta, you have theta, you have eta th instead of eta t. Can you put that in? Oh, the reason when we you have, don't the, have yeah, the theta. Yeah, yeah, so if you, you can put comma, mm -hmm. and then eta th, okay? Right. You remember this rule, that you can't have consecutive syllables starting with aspirated consonants. Right. So they get dissimilated. What? That's why you have the t there instead of the th. But when you don't have the theta, it reverts to what it original form was. Okay. Um, so and then then you're gonna get theta in the plural, and senton in the th in the second person plural. Theta, right? And te, and then oh. yep, and then optional theta, theta, and then. Oh, epsilon rather, because it's mm -hmm. theta epsilon, sorry, my bad. Ten ton. Okay. So these are a matter of what the last principal part is like, and just plugging in these endings. So I think the task is to memorize these, okay? They're distinctive, um, except in the second person plural form again, okay? Um, and I think you've got a job in front of you, which is to learn all of these endings, mm -hmm. okay? And not, not simple to do. But imperatives are common phenomena in spoken language, and we got in Greek poetry. We got people talking to each other all over the place. We've got we've got or, oratory and rhetoric in which people give orders, and we're going to work on them. If you get the Monty and Belt, it's a great thing. Okay.